Galatians 5. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the, the whole law. You are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. For a little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view than mine. The one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if brothers still preach circumcision, then why am I being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettled you would emasculate themselves. For you are called to freedom, brothers, only to do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through God serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. This is the reading of God's word. Thanks be to God. Thanks so much, Kurt. You may be seated. Appreciate you, man. Well, good morning, church. It is so good to be with you today. My name is Ryan Garrett, and I'm the associate pastor at our Stewart's Creek campus. Uh, I have been at LifePoint for about six years, and God has been moving over the past little bit, and uh, he called my family and me to be over at our Creek campus about, I don't know, three months ago, and God is doing some amazing things. I've, I miss seeing a lot of you. It is a joy to be back, to be with you this morning. It is a blessing to, uh, to come and be with you and to preach this morning. I'm honored that Pat would allow me to preach in his pulpit. I, I count it a privilege. Uh, the last time I preached in his pulpit uh, was on National Youth Pastor Preaching Sunday, which is uh, New Year's, because nobody comes to church. And so, uh, so uh, I've kind of had a joke in the office that I've been in preacher prison for a while and that I have an ankle bracelet on even today. Um, and so if you wouldn't mind at the end of our service, give my parole officer a good report about how today went. If you wouldn't mind, that would be great. Uh, but I just, I want to say thank you. It is a big deal to preach God's word and I am grateful to do so. And so today, like Kurt Reb, we are going to be in the book of Galatians. And as we continue through this series, we have called Set Free. And we're really taking a deep dive on Paul's letters, a letter to the churches of Galatia as these guys, these Judaizers have been coming in to add things to the salvation, uh, the, the story of salvation through Christ alone. And they were adding things to it. And so we're going to talk about that today as we, as we think about uh, just the freedom that God has given us. We have been set free. We've been set free to stand firm. But what does that mean? What does that look like? And so today I believe in God's word through Galatians chapter five, we'll be able to see that. I'm reminded of a story that one of my favorite evangelists told. Uh, I love Billy Graham, D.L. Moody uh, was, it was right underneath him. I, he told this story of a slave woman who had been set free, but had been confused about her freedom. She would go to her, her, her people, she would go to her friends, she would go to her family, and she, it, was, it was said that she had this conversation of confusion that, that, uh, that her people, uh, her, the fellow slave people were set free, but yet her master said that she wasn't set free. Her friends and her family would say that, uh, uh, that Lincoln had signed the Emancipation Proclamation and they were free. They were not under the bondage of slavery any longer, yet the master kept saying that what he did was out of line and it wasn't true, it wasn't right, and, but, and, and she really wasn't set free. She was so confused on this statement and there was no right that, that Lincoln had, but everyone around her is saying that she had been set free. 
And that's exactly what Paul is walking us through as we look at Galatians, uh, the book of Galatians really, but is specifically when they get to chapter five. The Galatians were listening to the, this group of people called the Judaizers that were coming in and telling the churches of Galatia that they needed to add something to the gospel, that they needed to add the Mosaic law. And it's almost like they're, they were being the old masters of saying that these were, you know, it's okay for Gentiles to get saved, but they got to add something something to it, particularly the Mosaic law and the things that are set in the law. And you know what that's called? That's called legalism. That's called legalism. I heard a definition of legalism recently, and I love this. Legalism, legalism is treating that which is good as though it is essential. Legalism is treating that which is good as though it is essential. And so much like the Galatians, I'm willing to bet that there are some people in here this morning that are dealing with that fact, the, the old yoke of slavery of legalism, that we've been liberated through Christ, yet we get back and we go back to that yoke of slavery. And we see this uh, in the churches of Galatia and we see that here. And so today, Paul gives us some encouragement. Paul gives us some things that we can walk through and walk out and some, I see two observations through God's word that will help us be able to stand firm for God. And number one, that's the very first thing we see, stand firm. Let's look back at our first verse in Galatians chapter five, verse one. For freedom, Christ has set us free and do not, uh, stand firm then therefore and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. The literal Greek word for freedom here is liberty. And that's one word we as Americans, we love liberty. We have a statue of liberty. We have a bell that is the Liberty Bell. We have an insurance company with a jingle that you'll be singing all the day. Liberty, 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 liberty. Like you'll be singing it, you'll, you'll say it over and over. We love liberty. And we think about this, we all want freedom, but Paul is saying something deeper here. We have been liberated through Christ. Liberty doesn't allow us to do whatever we want and go back to the old yoke of slavery that we would have to think that we earn our way into heaven. No, 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 that's not what it takes. And Paul is saying, we have been liberated into a relationship through Christ or with Christ through the cross. And that's all it takes. And so when anything that we add to our salvation, that's where legalism comes in. And yet there's an action that we must take. We must stand firm not to fall back into the trap of legalism. I mean, you remember, it's taking something that's good and making it essential. And so Paul is saying, okay, we, get, we gotta think about this. And don't, don't go back to the yoke of slavery. And what were the Judaizers main thing that they were using to, to help them, hold, really hold them captive to the Mosaic law? And that was circumcision. It was circumcision. And now circumcision isn't something that we use on a weekly basis here at LifePoint. We don't talk about circumcision a whole lot, but this, is, this was a big deal. They were saying that it's okay for the Gentiles to get saved, but they also must get circumcised. And this is, this is a big deal. And so we, we need to understand what circumcision is. We need, to, we need to have a good grasp of what it is. So since we have this big old screen, I brought some slides for us to talk about circumcision this morning. Just kidding, we're, we're not gonna, just, some of you tensed up really quick on that one. I promise we're not gonna do that. Let's think about this, 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 what circumcision was and is. It's a covenantal act that God commanded Abraham to do and the physical sign for his people. It, circumcision was the physical cutting off of the male reproductive organ as a sign of spiritual corruption as passed down from generation to generation through procreation. Circumcision was a blood sign of the future gospel. It was a blood sign of the future gospel. And so every male Hebrew would go through circumcision on the eighth day. And this was, this was incredible how God just even, just, if we were just to pause and think about how God made the human body, the male body, that the, the, the blood that would clot on that day, the eighth day, it was the perfect timing. God had everything in the palm of his hand. He's sovereign, he's perfect. And he knew that it was, a, it was to point to the future of the cross. 
And Jesus would, I mean, think about this. Jesus being a, a Hebrew, as a Jew, he would, he would have been circumcised on the eighth day. And as I was studying this, I came, I came to this realization that I've never thought about before. Everything that Jesus did, all the covenant acts, all the Passover, everything that the Jews would do would point to the cross. But you know, the very first time Jesus's blood would have been spilt would have been through circumcision. And that would have been a picture of the ultimate blood that would be spilt on the cross for us. So circumcision was a big deal, but what he's saying is, man, we're not adding this to the gospel. He's, he's not saying that it's, it didn't matter. He's saying that the cross of Christ was sufficient enough and we need to stand on that truth. Galatians, you need to stand on that truth. But here's the deal, the Galatians were being duped. They were being deceived into thinking that they needed to add something to their salvation, particularly circumcision. Look at verse three, he says, I testify again that every man who accepts circumcision, that he is obligated to keep the whole law, not just part of it, you had to keep everything. You had to be perfect. You had to do everything to the max and have this perfection. It's almost like uh, everyone who sped to get here to church this morning, if we were to get pulled over this morning, that we would be uh, uh, committed the sa- like the same level of crime as a murderer. We would have the same punishment. Everything, the whole law, everything. If you were guilty of one, you were guilty of all. In church, that's a dangerous place to live. That's a scary place to live if we're be honest. And that's a place I've lived a lot of my life. I grew up in a church, a small Southern Baptist church uh, right outside of Atlanta. And uh, it was nothing like this. We did not have these nice cushioned seats. We had the hard back pews, you know. We didn't even have cushion on the bottom. It was, it was, it was hard on the bottom and on the back. I mean, it was, it was, it was tough. I mean, we, were, we sang out of a hymn book. Some of you don't even know what a hymn book is, but we sang out of it. It was a book with all the songs in it. Number 330, you know what that was? Amazing Grace, I remember that one. But we sang out of that hymn book every Sunday. And when I was growing up, I was being discipled. The folks that would be discipling me we, we weren't fundamental, but it might as well have been because they, they'd have these sayings like, you've probably heard this saying, uh, don't drink, don't chew, don't run with girls that do. You ever heard that saying? We would hear that saying, but no one would tell us the why behind it. Nobody would say, this is the why. That's, that's probably a pretty good saying, but what, what, why, why do we not do these things? Why do we read God's word and hold God's word firm? Why do we do these things? It was just, don't do these things. And if you do these things, God's gonna be really upset at you. God's gonna be almost mad at you. And he's gonna be really disappointed in you. I'll never forget. I mean, remember what legal, that's so legalistic. Remember what legalism is, is taking something that's good and making it essential. And so I remember one time I was, I, I was driving down the road. I was, I was heading home and I was listening to Led Zeppelin. And, and I pull into my driveway. I get out of my truck. I go upstairs and I just felt this weight of guilt and shame and condemnation on my shoulders. I, I, I'll never forget it. It was like, there was no way I was taking a stairway to heaven because I was taking an escalator straight to hell. Like that, like that was how I felt. It was awful. And I dealt with this for a long time in my spiritual journey. Up to my late 20s, I dealt with this. This legalistic act that I had to do things to earn my way into heaven. And I would lay in my bed and I would look at my ceiling going, a uh, ceiling fan going around and around and just thinking back through my day, thinking about all the things that I did and asking forgiveness for him. God, forgive me for this, forgive me for this. And if I forgot one, I would just, I would freak out and just think, okay, God, please, please forgive me of all those sins that I'm not remembering right now. God, please forgive me, please forgive me. I I would feel like I would fall from grace. I would fall from grace. That's That's a tough place to live. There's some of us that have dealt with that before. Some of us have taken it a step further too thinking if we don't ask forgiveness for all of our sins, we will not be forgiven. That's not what God's word says. God's word says we have been set free in Christ. There's nothing that we can do that would make God pluck us out of his hand. 
We have been forgiven. We have been set free. We do not have to go back any longer to a yoke of slavery. Martin Luther, he loved this book. He loved the book of Galatians. And in fact, he, he considered the book of Galatians the Magna Carta of the New Testament. He loved the book of Galatians. He had a saying when it came to this section of scripture, Simul justice et peccator. Simul justice et peccator. And what that means is simultaneously justified and sinner. He knew that, that the only way that we would be made right before a holy God would be extra nos, outside of us, all through Jesus, all through the cross. We don't add anything to our salvation. We don't bring anything to the table. It's all what Jesus has done for us. And we don't have to bring, uh, we, we're, not, we're not counted righteous because of the things that we do. All the righteousness is, is in Christ and he imparts that on us. And that's good news. We don't have to go back to that yoke, that, that big piece of wood that would that block us to the yoke of slavery, to legalism. No, we have been set free through Christ. And you know what? That gives me hope. That should give you hope. And Paul talks about that. You know what? One of the biggest differences between an unbeliever and a believer is hope. You ever thought about that? Hope. Paul says in verse five, for through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. One day, we will not be simul justice et peccator. One day, we will be set free from all sin. We will be perfect as we stand before a holy God that we can praise him for eternity because he has given us grace through the cross of Christ. And there was nothing that we had to add to our salvation. It was all what he did on the cross for us. Praise be to God. We don't have to work out our salvation. The things that we do is because of what he has done on the cross. Praise the Lord. And during this time, it causes us to be sanctified. We walk through this process of sanctification until then, until we're standing before the Lord, we walk through sanctification, being made more like Christ, not falling back to the ways of sin, but being changed and transformed by God's word to be more like Jesus. We have to stand firm. We have to stand firm, firm to the lies and the traps that are be coming at us daily on a regular basis basis because here's the deal we see that we we must stand firm in Galatians chapter 5 but that's not the only observation I make that Paul tells us to run this race and to to live well he says you must stay in the race point number two stay in the race our students are probably going to chuckle at this because I, I say this a lot. I, I've, I've been known to say this a lot, that there are three things that I'm super passionate about. And then there are three things that I absolutely loathe. I hate more than, oh my goodness, I, I, I hate them. I despise them. I, I hate them. Number one, the, the things that I'm passionate about, I'm passionate about Jesus. I love Jesus. I was lost and now I'm found. I was blind. Now I see. I love the fact that Jesus has saved me. I'm so grateful for that. Number two, I'm second, the second thing I'm passionate about is my family. I love my family. I love my wife. I love my kids. I love them so daggone much. I love my family. And the number three, three thing that I'm uh, most passionate about is ministry. I love to do what I get to do. I love to pour into people. I love to make disciples. I love to, to walk this calling out. And I love that, that I get to serve this church. I'm so honored to serve this church. But with those things that I love, there's also things that I hate. And number one, right off the bat, I hate the devil. He's a punk, he's a liar, I hate the devil. Satan, I, I can't stand the guy, he's, he's a deceiver, he's a liar, uh, he, oh man, I can't stand him. But the number two and number three things go kind of back and forth, it depends on the day. It, number two would probably be running and number three would be math. I hate running in math. 
right up underneath the desk. I hate them. I hate, and it just depends on the day. Sometimes it's math, sometimes it's running. I despise it. And there was, there was a time I used to, I used to run a lot. I really did. I know it doesn't look like it now, but I did CrossFit for a while. And, and you know how some, you can tell that someone did CrossFit because they won't shut up about them doing CrossFit, right? So I did CrossFit for a while and there would be days that they would program running into the workout. And you know what, on those days, I would take those as rest days. You know, I would not go into the gym. I needed my, I needed recovery that day because I hated running so much. But here's the deal. Those of you, there's some of you in this room that absolutely love running. You need Jesus, but you love running. Like I get, like, but you love it. Why? Because it's, it's free. You can run anywhere and it's, it's, it's really healthy and it's good for you. It's good for your body. It's good for your heart. It's good. It's so good for you. But look at verse seven. Paul puts this, this metaphor in here. He says, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Those are words, honestly, that haunt me. You were running well. And you see the tense on that, that, that past tense. You were in stride with the Lord. You were reading your Bible. You were sharing the gospel. You were walking in step. But at some point, someone came in and hindered you from obeying the truth. That, that's, a, that's a haunting verse. R.C. Sproul says this. He makes note of this. He says, who, he didn't say, Paul didn't say, who kept you from obeying the law? He says, who kept you from obeying the truth? That's a big observation. I mean, we think about it, especially now, we get lied to so much, right? Politicians lie, social media lies, news media lies. It's like, it's just all lies that we hear, we see, and we see it on an ongoing basis. And it's hard to decipher what the truth is. But when we come to this, you know, I think about this same, tell a lie long enough, loud enough, and often enough, and people will start believing it is truth. You know who's quoted to say that? Hitler, Hitler. And these lies that are coming in, especially that are, can bleed in to this body, can bleed into the church of these, these lies of legalism that we have to add anything to the gospel and to salvation. And you hear Paul's passion here. You see it very clearly. And he gives these two metaphors. He says, who hindered you? This would be a, a military term that would, would, would mean a road that, that the, the military would blow up that would become impassable. So he said, who hindered you from obeying the truth? Who, who hindered you from going down this road and now you can't get across? And then he says, if that doesn't make the point, I'm gonna give you another one. He says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. Now this bread was huge and crucial in the Galatian culture. And they would use the bread on, in everything that they would eat, but just a little leaven, just a little yeast would be evident in the lump of dough because when it was baked, it would rise. So it would be evident. And Paul's saying, who came in on you? Who cut in on you? You need to understand this is not good. This is, these are lies. And it's almost as though you can hear Paul just kind of remembering what Jesus said in John 8, 44. He says this, when the devil, when he, the devil lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. Church, we have to surrender to the truth. We have to surrender to the truth and not lies. In order for us to stay in the race and run this way, race well and to stand firm on the gospel truth that we don't have to add anything to the cross. We have to understand who the truth is, not what the truth is. We have to understand who the truth is and who is, who is the truth. Well, Jesus said, I am the way, the life and the truth. In him, there is no lies. Where do we find that? Where do we see that? We see the truth in God's word. We see it right here. We find the truth. When, 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 Jesus, when John says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was from God, it's about Jesus. Every point, and I believe this book to be true from Genesis to maps, I believe this book to be true. There's no error in it. 
So how do we run this race well? How do we stand firm? We put this in the center of our lives. We treasure it. We stand firm on the gospel truth that there's no other way to salvation yet but through Christ. And now the overflow of that, it causes us to stand up for truth in a world that's lying to us on a regular basis. When the world says, throw in the towel on your marriage, it's done. Just throw it in. No, we have, to, we have to stay in the race and stand on the truth that God has ordained uh, this, these marriages, this covenant act between a man and a woman forever. It's a picture of the gospel. When you get that memo at work that says that you have to use the preferred pronouns of people in your, in your, in your office, No, you have to stand firm and stay in the race and understand what the truth of the gospel says in the Bible that God created man and God created woman in his image. He makes no mistakes. God makes no mistakes. And we stand firm on that. Students, when you're sitting in class and your teacher tells you that that there was this big bang and everything was created and we came from primordial ooze. No, we look back to the gospel or to the first book of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That is truth. And we stand on the truth. And that's what we're gonna do here at LifePoint. That's what we're gonna encourage you to do in every ministry that we have because we know that the liar, the devil, is going to try to thwart your thoughts and break off your mind to get you to stop obeying the truth. We must stand firm. We must run this race well. We must not, listen, we have to stand for the truth of the gospel because if we don't, we'll fall for the traps of the enemy every single time. If we don't stand for the truth of the gospel, we will fall to the traps of the enemy every single time. We have to, we have to know this book. We have, to, we have to love this book. We have to love this truth because this causes us to love God more. So we think about this. He says, who cut in on you? Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Sometimes when you're obeying the truth, it causes us to have to cut off things in our lives. Sometimes it causes us to cut off relationships that aren't honoring the Lord. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, he says, good, uh, uh, bad morals corrupt good character. Sometimes it causes us to cut away. Sometimes it causes us to cut away from things that we're consuming. Stop watching certain news channels. Stop following certain people on social media. Sometimes we might need to just cut out an app altogether to stop listening to the lies. And we don't do that. We don't do those things to just check these things off that God would love us anymore. No, we do that because God, because of what Christ has done for us, we do those things out of the overflow of what he's done. So we don't have to go back to the yoke of slavery any longer. We are, we are no, no longer bound to that. And we live in that truth. We live in that truth. It, and I'm gonna be honest. If you start living this truth out, it's not, it's not there, it could be hard. It could be tough. It could cause some friends to get upset at you. It could cause some, some relationship friction, but I'm gonna, I heard this quote and I love it. There's no quicker way to make enemies than to tell the truth, especially when it comes to the truth of the cross, especially when it comes to the truth of the gospel. Because when we think about this, what did Jesus say? I did not come to bring peace, but a sword because the gospel is offensive to those who are perishing. It causes people to understand that they have to relinquish control. It causes people to say, no, I surrender all, God. I, I, I have nothing left. I'm not holding anything back. It's all to you, King Jesus. And I'm not gonna hold anything, but we don't wanna do that. When you think about it, we were born, we were born with sin in our lives. We were born sinners. I mean, think about this. We were born with sin. And what is the central focus of sin? I, S-I-N, we were born sinners. Sin, we are the central focus of sin. Why? Because we're selfish. We wanna do our own thing. And when we tell that truth, 
We need to tell it from the gospel point of freedom. I think the world, well, you've probably heard this saying before, the world knows what the church is against, has a very clear picture of what the church is against, but does the world know what the church is for? And we are for the truth. I mean, even Paul says that when this comes, listen, verse 11, why am I being persecuted? In that case, case, the offense of the cross has been removed. This was a big deal. He was being persecuted with this, but he was so passionate about this. This was such a big deal in Paul's life, especially the circumcision part. He's like, if, if you're gonna just cut off a little, just cut off everything. And we, we quickly run past that and we don't wanna hit that verse because like, oh, wow, that, that's, that's such a big deal. I wish that those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. No, that's a big deal. He's saying this is such a damning thing that will send people uh, to fall away from grace. When we think about that in verse five, it wasn't a fall away from grace from falling away from salvation. No, we have fallen away from the grace that God has given us. We have forgotten the goodness of our Lord. We have forgotten what Christ has done for us. And we don't have to live any longer in the bondage of legalism. We have been set free. We've been set free. So what do we do with this freedom? We run well. We stay in the race, we stand firm. Let's look back at verse 13. He says, for you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Our natural bent is that legalism. Our natural bent is to want to go back to the things that we do for God. And we think about this, we equate our work, like our physical work, our jobs with our our salvation. When we were young, we did chores around the house. Some of you kids, you need to do chores around the house. You're welcome parents. And, and at the end of the week, you'll get a little money on the side. So you do those chores, you get money. At the end of the week, from working a hard, a hard a day's work all throughout every week, maybe every two weeks, you get a paycheck every week. But in too many times, we equate that back to our salvation, that we serve God, we do these things that it will make us feel good and we'll do all this, these acts of service. We'll work and we'll serve and we'll give and we'll do that, these things that God might be proud of us that we might earn God's love just a little more, that he might love us just a little more. And that's not how it works. God has enough love for you now and nothing that you can do would make him love you anymore. But here's the deal. Nothing that you can do would make him love you any less. Praise be to God. And when I think about this, everything is done through what Christ has said. And the two, he, he, he said, in the, what are the two greatest commandments? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, with everything that you have, and love your neighbor as yourself. And when we think about this, Paul ends this section. He's saying, everything's fulfilled in this, that you love your neighbor as yourself. I fly from time to time, maybe you do. I, I don't fly as much as I used to. But uh, when you get on the plane, you get settled in, you, the door's shut, and the flight attendant always comes to the front of the plane, and they go through that. You know that speech they give that no one's listening to? You know that one? Everybody's getting that last text before you fly out. You know what I'm talking about? Man, you, you realize that one of the things that the flight attendant says that if this cabin loses pressure, mass will come down, and you put yours on first, and then you take care of the person next to you. I think when we think right here, what Paul's wanting us to understand that we have to understand that it is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and that's where our salvation stands. 
We have got to understand that. We have to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And out of the overflow of that, it will cause us to love our neighbor as ourselves. It will just naturally happen. There won't be any bones about it. You just do it because that's what the overflow of what Christ has done for you. And so when we see this, we understand that there's nothing that we can do to add to our salvation. We understand that we give out the overflow of our hearts because of what Christ has done for us. We, we go on sending trips because we wanna tell the world what Christ has done. We're gonna leave here in just a little bit, go to Dollar General, go to Walmart, get supplies to put on the trailer to take the people who are in need. Why do we do that? Because we see that that's the truth of God's word because that's the overflow of what he's done for us. That's the overflow. How do we stay in this race? How do we stand firm? It's through the truth of God. I was at Stewart's Creek High School uh, couple, this, this past week and one of the football players came up to me uh, after practice and he asked this question. Uh, I'm the character coach over there for the team. And he asked this question. It, it blew me away. It shocked me, like really shocked me. He says, Ryan, if you were to go back to my age, he's a 10th grader. He said, well, if you were to go back to my age and you could do something different in your faith, what would you do? I about fell out on that turf. That was such a big, huge question. It was massive. I never would have thought, I mean, he had just been running drills for two hours and he comes over and asked me that question. I was so proud of him. And I had to think for a second and then it dawned on me. I knew exactly what I would have done. I would have fallen in love with this book more. I would have treasured the words in this book. Not only would I have treasured them, I wouldn't have read the Bible just for information. I would read, read these words as transformation for my heart. And folks, that's how we need to find this truth. That's how we live this out today. That's the, that's the good news of the gospel, that you were a sinner in need of a savior and God worked it out for you and sent Jesus on a rescue mission for your soul. And because of what he's done for us, we are able to be set free. And we don't have to go back any longer to the slavery of sin or legalism or anything else because it is all through Christ we have been set free. This week, our world needs to see that. This week, our, our, our friends need to see that. This week, our nation needs to see that. And we can live that out at LifePoint. I've seen you do it. Let's don't go back to that old slavery, that old legalism. Let's don't go back there any longer. Let's live in the freedom that Christ has given us. Amen. God, we love you. I thank you for your word. I thank you that it is living. And I thank you that it is active. God, I thank you that it is sharper than any two-edged sword. And it calls us to stand firm in your truth and it causes us to stay in the race. It causes us to fight for the truth. It causes us to stand on your word because your word is true. And so Lord, I pray that we would understand that this morning. God, I pray that we would, we would worship you because you deserve all the praise pray that we would sing to you not just as what we do at the end of a service no God we would contemplate what we've heard through your word and God would you be magnified in this place would you be magnified in our hearts that we have been set free through Christ In just a moment, our praise team is gonna lead us through a song. I wanna ask that you, I know the temptation is going to be to want to leave early and run out, but I wanna invite you to stay in the room. Ask the Holy Spirit to search your heart like Psalm 139 says. See if there's any areas of your life that you're falling back into that trap of legalism. And ask the Lord to help you as we sing. We put Christ be magnified in our lips. We give him glory. After we sing the song, I wanna come back and I wanna dismiss us.
may we give God the glory in this moment because he deserves it all.